uh, interest rates could go to eight, nine percent. Is, is that what you said? Which rates are you referring bond to? Yields, bond yields, uh, 10 bond years, years, 10 years, year. 10 year U.S. Treasuries, 10 year U.S. Treasuries. You know, at, at some point, they will uh, probably try to underwrite the, the economy. And when they underwrite the economy, they will go to yield curve control in the Western world. But wouldn't that prevent the uh, the rate from going higher? I mean, why? No, why, then why? The, the, then yeah. the currency, then the currency collapses. Then the currencies collapse, and then you have high inflation. And then, you know, sooner something has to give. You cannot control currencies, interest okay. rates, and the system. Sometimes later this decade, I expect a major economic crisis, a very severe crisis, uh, uh, a systemic crisis uh, that we have never seen before in our generation. And then the wealth will be gone very quickly. The U.S. labor market continues to show further signs of deterioration, as evidenced by a sudden drop in job openings in October. According to sources, job openings fell to the lowest level in two years to 8.7 million. The decline in job vacancies brought the ratio of openings to available employees down to 1.3 to 1 compared to 2 to 1 earlier this year. The November jobs report is expected to show an increase of nearly 173,000 jobs, with an unemployment rate of 3.9%. Ground News has been my go-to source for information because of how easy I can access multiple news sources at once. It's an app and website that aggregates articles from thousands of sources all around the world. I'm happy to have them as a continuous sponsor because they save me time from having to Google different sources when I need to read multiple perspectives on a story. With my vantage plan, I can see in their newsroom section that there are over 45 sources covering the story, with the majority of coverage coming from the center of the political spectrum. What's great is that we can see both local and international sources. We can see here, for example, the Japan Times and more. With Ground News, it's easy to compare the headlines to see how different outlets are covering the story. For example, the source Dallas Express tagged as right-leaning, says job openings dropped by 617,000. With the Financial Times tagged to center, uh, they wrote that job openings dropped to the lowest level in two years, not disclosing how much it dropped like the Dallas Express. It also says the job openings data offers more evidence that the U.S. central bank's efforts to damp uh, demand with high interest rates is working, although officials insist cuts to rates are not on the cards in the near term. If you subscribe through my link in the description down below at ground.news slash David Lin, you can get 30% off their Vantage subscription for unlimited access. And now we'll hear from our next guest regarding the macroeconomic landscape, Felix Zuloff, who is the founder of Zuloff Consulting. Felix worked for decades on Wall Street as a portfolio manager at several large institutional uh, hedge funds, including at UBS. Felix, welcome to the show. It's good to host you today. Thank you, David, uh, for having me. I'm excited uh, to cover uh, some topics on world markets. I want to start with the U.S. economy and then branch out to the global economy, and then finally your portfolio allocation and sector allocation outlook. Uh, but first, let's talk about uh, what's happening with the labor market. Job openings in the U.S. fell to a 28-month low to 8.7 million in October. When you put this number into the context of a deteriorating labor market, which is to say that the unemployment rate has now ticked up to 3.9%, up significantly from the beginning of the year. What does this number mean to you? I'm a little bit different than most uh, in this industry, and I do not weight um, uh, short-term high-frequency data too highly. I look at trends, but uh, the data obviously suggests that uh, employment is uh, quite robust, and, uh, and real income is also growing. And therefore, it could be surprising that the economy in the coming months uh, could likely surprise on the upside uh, relative to expectations. Uh, you know, there is a very strong consensus out there that this is going to be a soft landing and the Fed will cut rates um, starting in spring, et cetera. And I disagree with that. I think the economy will do uh, better a short term or in the first quarter, maybe into the second quarter. And the Fed will not cut in the first half uh, of next year. And uh, there could be a big disappointment in the bond market. We are currently seeing a medium term decline in bond yields uh, and it could decline to 
the 370 level for 10-year treasuries or so. But then I think we are in for some surprise uh, and it could bounce back quite strongly. I wouldn't even be surprised if it would go to new highs, uh, maybe that 550 or something like that, before declining then in earnest uh, into the second uh, half of the 2024 year, um, where it could be down to 3% plus minus 25 basis points. Felix, generally speaking, I'm not talking about this specific data point, but generally speaking, uh, higher job openings in the economy, does that signal growth? Does that mean that if you have more job openings, businesses are expanding and so therefore they're hiring people? Or potentially the other side of the uh, coin is that if you have a lot of job openings, there's a lot of slack in the labor market, uh, productivity may not be very high because, you know, uh, because of the slack. So how would you generally interpret job openings? Well, you have to uh, uh, look at all the figures in a context, and the context is obviously a very robust employment situation, very low unemployment situation. And in that context, uh, this number would suggest uh, the uh, economy is doing better than generally expected. I want to talk about what happened uh, over the weekend. Uh, the rising gold price, it spiked to uh, to a new all-time high on the back of uh, an attack by the Houthis on U.S. Navy ships. Now, the day after on Monday, it came back down and actually lost any, all of its gains. Felix, was this a reaction purely to uh, geopolitical tensions that arose for less than 24 hours over the weekend? Or is this the beginning of a longer trend of risk off? I think the gold market uh, is changing its character, uh, whereas... Uh... In the past, when gold rallied, it was usually when real interest rates declined. Uh, this recent rally that we have seen from 1800 or so, or even yeah, a little bit lower even, uh, was really a rally together with rising real interest rates, which is a new phenomenon. And I think uh, this rally in gold is more to geopolitical factors than due to uh, monetary factors. The monetary factors will kick in later. Uh, if uh, the Fed um, uh, eases and cut rates uh, uh, probably sharply in the second half of 24, that's when the monetary factors will kick into gold. The eight-year cycle in gold, which is very pronounced and has a good track record, calls for a low in gold, for a cycle low in gold in 24. I said a few months ago that uh, we will probably have the low sooner, a year ahead of the theoretical low, and then we rallied. And uh, I think this is the early stage of another bull cycle in gold into the later part of the 2020s. And I would not exaggerate the short-term um, uh, tremendous uh, moves up and down. Of course, a short-term reversal like what we have seen is usually not very bullish short-term. It usually speaks of an ending move. But I would not, uh, I would not overweight that. Uh, I think gold is in a preparation for a big bull market in the next few years. First, due to geopolitics, gold, physical gold has been moved from the West to the East or from the Western industrialized economies to the global South economies because they are turning away step by step from the US dollar as a reserve currency. Uh, the US dollar has been misused as a political weapon and these derates the US dollar and upgrades gold as a store of value for reserves of central banks in other parts of the world that is not necessarily a close friend to the US. Generally speaking, would you say that geopolitical tensions are rising around the world to the point where it becomes uh, a necessary risk to watch for investors? Oh, definitely. What we are seeing is you know, the old world order of uh, a unipolar US-centric uh, stable world order with the US on top of it, of course, uh, that has crumbled. This is the past. It's gone. We are in a transition phase to a multipolar order, which we do not know exactly how it will look like. So we are now in a period of disorder with the top dog very weak. And because the top dog is very weak, you see all sorts of conflicts uh, popping up, uh, coming to the surface, uh, be it uh, Armenia, Azerbaijan, Serbia, Guyana, 
uh, Gaza, um, um, Ukraine, etc. And I started writing about the uh, coming conflicts and uh, and wars in 2018 uh, when people laughed at me. And and we see that happening now. And I think we will see more war. And the risk of broadening wars, pulling in the big guys, is really on the rise. When you say the big dog is weakening, I'm assuming you're referring to the U.S., what does that mean? How is it weakening? Well, uh, the, the U.S. is just not respected uh, in the world as it used to be. If, uh, if the foreign minister of the U.S. Uh, uh, goes to uh, uh, Saudi Arabia and uh, the ruler there let him wait seven hours uh, in front of his office door, uh, that uh, shows disrespect. Uh, when uh, uh, Blinken goes to uh, Turkey, uh, Erdogan does not receive him. The prime minister does not receive him. The foreign minister does not receive him. The guy who eventually received him was the deputy mayor of Istanbul. And that shows you that uh, the U.S. has lost uh, a lot of respect uh, uh, in the last few years. And this is not just because of the current administration. It is... Uh, uh, because uh, the U.S. Uh, uh, has behaved uh, very dominantly for many decades. You know, there were, uh, uh, the U.S. has organized uh, over 80 regime shifts in the world uh, since World War II, uh, and some even in democratically uh, uh, democratic countries. And nobody said a word as long as it was a stable order and discipline was in case. But that has changed now, and therefore people are speaking up. Latin American has turned more towards the Chinese. Uh, Africa is uh, in Chinese uh, territory now, uh, and, and the world is changing. It's undergoing dramatic change, and the markets are not taking notice yet. But why do you say we're shifting to a multipolar world? Why can't the U.S. be replaced by another superpower, therefore another hedge money in the, in, in the global uh, arena? Could that, could that be possible? Well, it could be possible, but no other country or nation who could fill uh, the shoes of the U.S. at the present time is around. Uh, the, China is not strong enough to do that. And China doesn't want to do that. Uh, China wants to have its influence on the world, but it doesn't want to play the role of the world policeman as the U.S. did in the past. And therefore, I think it's more likely that we will end up in a multipolar world. And it's actually up to the diplomats to work that out. And so far, we have very weak diplomats, so the diplomats are simply not uh, around these days. Uh, uh, and therefore... The risk is high that we get to the new world order via wars. Uh, during the uh, Cold War, we had a arguably bipolar world. There were fewer armed conflicts uh, around the world than than today and before the Cold War. Uh, history has taught us that when there is one or only two superpowers in the world, uh, there are fewer armed conflicts. When there is a multipolar world, when everyone is vying for power, that's when we see more kinetic wars in more regional um, conflicts. Uh, is that what's going to happen? We're going to see uh, a, a shift towards many different pockets of power what, as opposed to just a bipolar world like the U.S. versus the uh, former USSR? No, I think it's a, it's a multipolar world. We do not know yet uh, who the major players will be. China is obviously one. The U.S. will remain uh, uh, one of the strongest, if not the strongest nation. But it, it's impossible to see a world where 4% of the world population can dictate to others how they have to behave. And not even 17% China uh, of the world population could fill that role. It's, it's, I don't see that. Well, the 4% of the population controls most of the world's wealth. So unless there's a shift in wealth, the shift in power won't happen, right? Well, the wealth shift can happen very quickly. You know, let's say uh, we have uh, sometimes later this decade, I expect a major economic crisis, a very severe crisis, uh, uh, a systemic crisis uh, that we have never seen before in our generation. And then the wealth will be gone very quickly. Oh, it's okay. all paper wealth. Tell us about that. Tell us about this economic crisis that we haven't seen before. What is this going to look like? How will how will it unfold? 
Well, I described the uh, 2020s as the year of the roller coasters in the financial markets. And, uh, you know, our system is a fiat currency system. And in each cycle, uh, the debt and the leverage in the system goes up. And that means in each cycle, central banks have to inject more liquidity to uh, uh, prevent the system from breaking down and to rejuvenate another cycle. And uh, and I think that will happen uh, sometimes in the second half of 2024. And then we start the next cycle. And the next cycle will be led by uh, equities and commodities. Uh, the commodity uh, price, you, you know, there is an underinvestment in the commodity sector. And about two, uh, three quarters of the commodities are controlled by the BRICS countries. And in the conflict between uh, the global south against the uh, the G7, uh, you know, they will use that weapon to make life uh, more difficult uh, for the Western world. And therefore, I see commodity prices rising sharply uh, together with equity prices from, let's say, summer 24 into um, uh, late 25, early 26. And that means that inflation rates will rise very sharply too. They will probably go higher than what we have seen in this cycle because we are on a secular rise in inflation and in interest rates. And, and it goes in cycles, of course. And uh, the next rise will then probably produce um, treasury bond yields for tens, uh, let's say 8% or even higher. And that will, uh, that will bring on a disaster for our system that is over leveraged. Wait, and, wait. Then, and then, and that would trigger what I would call a depression. But we will not have a depression like the 1930s, because in the 1930s, we had the setup of a stable gold anchored currency system. And they let the economy go down, but the currency stayed solid i think the next time we have a fiat currency system they will underwrite the economy and let the currencies go down which will uh, lead to uh, probably currency reforms and uh, major defaults uh, defaults by governments etc cetera, etc cetera. so i think all hell could break loose in the later part of the 2020s uh, and that's what I call the roller coaster, up and down in a major way. And that's why investors should be aware that investing in a passive way and just sitting and holding tight with your investments will not work in this decade. Felix, uh, you mentioned that uh, interest rates, if I didn't hear you wrong, uh, interest rates could go to 8 9%. Is, is that what you said? Wh which rates are you referring bond to? Yields, bond yields. Uh, bond ten years, yields. 10-year ten ten year. Ten year U.S. Treasuries. 10-year U.S. Treasuries. You know, at, at some point, they will uh, probably try to underwrite the, the economy. And when they underwrite the economy, they will go to yield curve control in the Western world. But wouldn't that prevent the uh, the rate from going higher? I mean, why? No, why, then why? The, the, then yeah. the currency Then the currency collapses. Then the currencies collapse, and then you have high inflation. And then, you know, sooner something has to give. You cannot control currencies, interest okay. rates, and the system. Can, That's can impossible. Walk, can you walk us through the logic one more time of why the 10-year will rise to 8 9%? People are anticipating the Fed to cut rates next year. Uh, that should bring down the short end of the curve to two-year. How, how is that going to affect the 10-year? Well, I, I said we will have a, a recession, probably a mild recession. We will okay. have much lower much lower stock prices, uh, let's say in the low 3,000 in the S&P in the later part or late summer, second half of 2024. And, uh, and then the Fed and other central banks do what they always do when, when you have that set up. They uh, uh, inject liquidity in a major way and prevent the system from melting down. Uh, and things like that. And the result of that is that the liquidity flows into all sorts of assets because the real economy cannot uh, you make use of all that money. And uh, and short rates go down, of course. Uh, bond yields will probably not go down. They will, they will probably go up. Then they may go into yield curve control. Uh, it's obvious that in such a scenario, uh, the price of oil uh, will go to $150, $200. Okay without geopolitical problems. If we have on top of that geopolitical problems, 
it could go much higher. And that gives you an inflation rate of way over 10%. Uh, so uh, that in that scenario, 10-year treasury bonds will not stay at 4%. Uh, are, are, you, are you considering that the money supply, I'm talking about M2, has been contracting? Uh, shouldn't that help with, with bringing down inflation? Well, you have money supply and you have velocity, the speed at which money supply uh, turns over in the economy. And I think there are all sorts of structural changes and it's difficult to interpret uh, and read the money supply uh, uh, the way you could in a stable environment. This is not a stable environment. You have uh, institutional changes. You have uh, uh, an increasing part of the lending in the economy is done by private debt uh, uh, companies and, and less so by the banks. And these are all changes that feed into that money supply number. Therefore, I would not take that at par value. And the Wall Street Journal article uh, several months ago of a crash coming uh, uh, soon, and that was a few months ago because of money supply numbers, I think was wrong. Okay, uh, shifting gears, you mentioned that we may go into a recession next year in the U.S. You're based in Europe right now, if I'm correct. Is Europe already, is most of Europe already in a recession? Right now I'm in Florida, but oh, okay. uh, I'm, I'm usually, I'm, I'm based uh, principally in, uh, in Europe. Uh, Europe is a borderline of recession uh, and uh, it differs by country. Of course, uh, uh, Spain and Italy are doing uh, better. Uh, Germany is doing uh, uh, very badly. Uh, but part of it is um, uh, self uh, uh, self uh, organized in a way. Okay. Well, if you were to factor in economic growth differentials between the U.S. and its peers, also interest rate differentials between the U.S. ten year and other uh, treasury yields around the world, uh, would you short the dollar right now? No, certainly not. Uh, I think uh, the dollar has topped uh, for the cycle in September of last year. And it has gone through two medium-term declines. It is now in the later stages of the second medium-term decline. Uh, it could go a little bit lower. It could go to 100, uh, the dollar index, or even 96 or so. Uh, but when this ends, and I think this will be in the first half of Q1, uh, I think the dollar will attempt another rise. And, uh, and and that goes hand in hand with, I said, about the economy and the potential risk that uh, bond yields could surprise uh, the uh, uh, pronounced consensus of declining bond yields. Okay. Uh, now, you mentioned that uh, commodities uh, will do well. Can you just specify which commodities you're referring to, which will perform the best? I think it's the whole basket of commodities. Uh, the best uh, performance will be achieved by those where uh, Russia is a large um, uh, producer, uh, I think, uh, and where some of the other BRICS countries are uh, large producers. I think oil will do very well. I said when uh, uh, Russia entered Ukraine in uh, February, I said in March, when we had the spike in the oil price to $130, I said, we go down to $60. Uh, we are 69 uh, today, I understand. We could go to $60, $55 sometimes uh, in the first half of next year. And then I think oil from that level has a chance to uh, triple or quadruple. Uh, 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 based on what? A supply crunch? Based on the fact that you will then have a normalization due to the stimulation. And you will have a situation where the OPEC plus countries control the supply. And, uh, you know, Europe is completely dependent on uh, Middle Eastern oil. Uh, the U.S. Uh, is uh, sort of destroying its shale operations. Uh, the Biden administration has pursued a completely wrong strategy on energy. Uh, the green uh, wave uh, was... Uh, 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 a nonsense that really uh, reduced investment in the oil sector and in the gas sector. And therefore, we will have a shortage uh, going into 25 and uh, 26. Yeah. Are you not concerned about a global slowdown killing uh, the demand for oil? That's what you're having now. You know, the world economy is weak. 
uh, the world economy is weak. You should not uh, uh, assess the world economy based on the U.S. The U.S. is uh, the best uh, horse in the stable uh, or the least dirty uh, shirt uh, in the laundry. But Asia is weak. Uh, uh, China is weakish and has structural problems, and it cannot go back to the growth rates we have seen in the past 20 years. That's impossible. Uh, Europe is structurally weakened uh, for all sorts of reasons, wrong policies, demographics, etc. And the U.S. is the U.S. is relatively strong because the U.S. Have, has experienced the strongest fiscal support of all of these nations. Well, but 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 going back to my question, don't you think that a weakening global economy uh, will will weigh down? On demand, hence weighing down on the price of oil. Uh, that is what we that is what we are seeing. The world economy is growing at one point five percent, and in the past fifty years, one point five percent in real terms was a recession, and uh, and that's why oil has declined from one hundred and thirty to sixty nine. Right. So if already, you think, and if and you it goes think, further. If you think inflation will return, first of all, when do you think it will return? And the second part of the question: What's the Federal Reserve going to do about it? Uh, I think we could see some pop short term, depending on uh, some distortions like uh, the Panama Canal. Uh, uh, there is not enough water on the lake in the lake right now. And the uh, ships are queuing up. Uh, uh, there is a problem with the Suez Canal uh, due to the Houthis uh, uh, attacking ships in the Red Sea. And therefore, ships are rerouting. And these could all lead to bottlenecks in uh, in the goods prices, and 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 could lead to some pops. I think cyclically, inflation will bottom out next year, and then rise for a number of years. Uh, I think very short term, due to the bottleneck problem I mentioned, we could see some pops that could surprise. So, is the Fed done raising rates then? The Fed will um, is probably done raising rates, but it will not cut in the next uh, six or seven months. I do not expect the Fed to cut rates in the first half, and that will be a big disappointment to the bulls. Yeah, because the markets, the CME Fed watch to us pricing in a significant probability of a cut by March. So you're right that that is you know kind of that will not that that will not that will in my view in my way of looking at the world that will not happen. Uh, right. So given your view of the world, then what is your preferred uh, portfolio allocation into 2024? You have to be very flexible. Right now, I'm uh, very light uh, long uh, equities uh, into the first quarter. And I cannot say whether the high will be in January or March. Uh, but I'm looking for an important top. And I think breaking to marginal new highs will be a trap. And uh, and you, there will be a, a great hurrah in the medias, and uh, it will suck in uh, more more money from the sidelines, etc. And then I think the surprises come in the bond market uh, and in the economy, uh, and and then you have a decline coming in the stock market. Then because the American indices have been the outperformer for 15 years, and the concentration of the number of stocks is more extreme than ever in the history of the stock market. I expect that these stocks will decline sharply because they are the only ones people can sell because they are overweighted and overconcentrated in these seven magnificent stocks. And, and therefore, I think uh, for these technical reasons, the decline in the stock market could be much sharper than economic numbers would suggest. Well, why do you think the stock market will decline after another rally? In other words, why do you think there's going to be another high before this decline happens? Because my indicators say so. Okay. <laughs> Can you, you know, I, yeah. I, 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 I look at, the, first of all, I think the Fed is making a mistake by being too easy. The, I think the Fed is underestimating uh, the um, or, or has been overestimating uh, ex uh, excess reserves in the system, bank reserves. And I think it's adding money uh, over, the, over the year end. And this is like in 2000, sort of uh, a liquidity push 
into January and then it fades because then the Fed has to step back and reassess the situation. And if I'm right on what I said about the economy, they will be rather tightening liquidity, not hiking rates, but tightening liquidity than doing elsewhere. And, and when that happens and momentum indicators show a tiring of the rally and, uh, and breath, et, et cetera, I'm waiting for the sell signals. And when I see the sell signal, I will go short. Is there a particular U.S. equity sector you prefer for next year? Oh, on the short side, I prefer uh, the Magnificent Seven or the FANG stocks or the NASDAQ 100. Yeah. Anything on the law side? No. I, uh, I, when the market goes down as much as I expect, uh, I have no interest to be on the long side. I'm not smart enough to figure out what goes against the trend. So let, let's say you're right and then this this downtrend happens. What would you do? Are you going to rotate into another asset or will you just will you just sit on cash? Cash. Cash. cash? I will sit on cash. I may trade uh, the bonds. Uh, you know, if the bonds have another spike, I will enter the bonds. But for me, the bonds are a trade and not an investment. Uh, the, the the stocks will be, you know, the opportunity will come once the stocks have declined sharply and all the ingredients of uh, pessimism and what you see at the bottom are around. And then I want to go long because I think the next rally up goes to new highs, uh, maybe 6,000 on the S&P. Is, uh, is there a bottom that you will look for uh, once that bottom is reached? You would be more comfortable getting back into the S&P? Yes, absolutely. The bottom should be uh, preferably below 3,500. Okay, well, that's a big decline from uh, current levels. Uh, now, uh, Felix, what about emerging markets? Uh, people are talking about India rising. Uh, India's population is now the world's largest. Uh, potentially, that could be the next China in terms of economic growth. What do you think? Potentially, India, as far as I can remember, India has always been the land of the future, and it probably will remain so. Uh, uh, obviously, they have uh, big positives. They have the English language. They have the British law. Um, uh, they uh, have a growing population, and this all speaks for um, further progress, but they are not as disciplined and as well organized as the Chinese have been. Therefore, progress will be much slower. And the, that, market, if, uh, the market is pretty rich um, and foreigners can only invest in India via a few selected funds that have permission. And therefore, I would, not, I would certainly not do it at the present time. If we have a washout, as I expect, then India may be an important, uh, an important market. And emerging markets in general, I think, uh, and foreign markets also, will begin to outperform in the next cycle, the US stock market. Because I think the craziness about uh, the Magnificent Seven is rather smelling of an end period of an era rather than the beginning of a new era. And, uh, and, and, and last asset class I'll ask you about is, is Bitcoin. People, Some people have said it's possibly the new digital gold. It's the new safe haven to go into if, in fact, the economy falters and the stock markets collapse, do you share that view? I'm not sure. You know, I'm probably too old uh, to be uh, too excited about Bitcoin. I do not understand what the intrinsic value is. I understand the concept, of course. Mm -hmm. uh, and, uh, and I think uh, the recent uh, permission uh, by the SEC to launch uh, Bitcoin ETFs uh, by some of the large investment banks gives you the next generation of potential buyers and in a limited supply environment that is bullish. So uh, yes. uh, I, I can see it going up further, but I would be very careful if the stock market tops out in the first quarter, be aware that Bitcoin can also go down, not just up. Final question. You've had uh, many, many decades working on the buy side in many large institutional hedge funds. I'd like you to address the efficient market hypothesis. I've interviewed Eugene Fama, who is a Nobel laureate, uh, who was one of the pioneers of this hypothesis, which basically states that markets are efficient. It's very difficult, if not impossible, to consistently beat the markets over a long extended period of time. Is that true? 
It's very difficult and the majority can uh, not do it. I agree with that. But there are always a few guys out there who have proven that they can do it. And uh, I recall as a young guy, I was sent over when I was at UBS. I was sent over to Wells Fargo. They were the leaders in uh, modern portfolio theory at that time with Bill, Bill Faust and, and, and those guys and Bill Sharp. And uh, I attended a seminar and looked at it and I came back and I said, it's no good for us. I do not believe in it. What what what, what part you, of the theory? You, you have agree? to have you have to have a time horizon of thirty or forty years that it may work. And uh, right. first of all, I'm too old now, and I want to have uh, a short term excess, not uh, hoping for long term excess, and then get frustrated if it doesn't show up. The um, small minority of fund managers who consistently beat markets, what are they doing that other people aren't? They have a special gene, uh, which is the contrarian gene. Uh, they uh, can be lonely at tops and at bottoms. You are lonely. Uh, the uh, crowd psychology works against you. Uh, you are locked up. You cannot make a decision in a committee at the extremes in the market. You will never succeed because you will always walk away with a compromise. You have to be a lonely wolf uh, and you have to like that situation. Uh, and I, uh, in my career, whenever I felt lonely and I got pushback uh, from all others uh, around me, I knew I was on the right track. Uh, so you have to have a special personality, a very critical mind and, uh, and, uh, 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 and the contrarian gene, a very pronounced contrarian gene. All right. Well, Felix, wonderful discussion. Where can we learn more about your or from your critical mind? Where can we uh, read your work and learn from you? Uh, you can go to uh, my homepage, uh, felixzulauf.com uh, or write at info at felixzulauf.com and um, our marketing people will take care of it. Excellent. Well, I appreciate your time, uh, Mr. Zulauf. Best of luck to you and your uh, research. Uh, happy end of the year, and uh, we'll speak again soon. Thank you. It's been a pleasure, David. Thank you for having me. All the best. Thank you very much, and thank you for watching. Don't forget to subscribe and like this video and follow Felix in the links down below.